The next part of Anno's career can be potentially confusing if you don't look into it right. In 1998, he is credited for directing Kare Kano, of which he infamously left the production after creative disagreements with the author of the original manga. He is also credited in 1998 for directing the live action film Love and Pop, but listing them this way as they are on Wikipedia is actually kind of misleading. Anno launched into writing and directing Love and Pop immediately after finishing work on End of Evangelion, and the film was released early into 1998, its creation having been spurred by the advent of digital camcorder technology, allowing Anno to get into live action directing on the cheap without having to pay absorbent film costs. Love and Pop is a fascinating little movie, and it's easy to imagine why Anno would have wanted to make it after constantly running into production issues with anime over the course of the past decade. The film was clearly shot on the cheap and quick, and Anno went totally off the rails with his creative freedom, to the point that nearly every shot in the film is totally weird. At a glance, it would be simple to deride this film as some cheap art house fluff by a crazy anime man who doesn't know what he's doing with an actual camera, except that after about 20 minutes or so, the film actually gets pretty good and kinda makes sense. If Love and Pop convinced me of anything, it's that when Hideaki Anno looks at a script, he seems to imagine every single line as having its own totally distinct shot to go along with it. It never seems to occur to him that he could shoot something in a standard way or by conventional means. It's possible even, though unlikely, that he just doesn't know or understand the conventions, but I think if his animation work is taken into consideration, it's more likely that Anno tries to visually communicate the emotions of every line in his script with as much weight as the words themselves. Even if a lot of the shots in Love and Pop are clearly just meant to look weird and fun, it never seems like there's a shot that Anno didn't think about how it would be presented, for better or for worse. Perhaps the freedom of the third dimension was something slightly excessive to be handed to someone like him at this time, and to his cinematographer who would go on to work with less hyperactive yet equally experimental films like Bright Future, but nonetheless, I think it speaks to Anno's strength of vision that his directing stands out so much in every medium. Perhaps the fervor and energy which Anno brought to Love and Pop had yet to subside by the time he came to work on Kare Kano, because his shot compositions and the energy of how each scene flows together was even more uniquely breakneck in the early episodes of that series. Even if Anno eventually came to disagreements with the producers and with the author of the original manga and ended up leaving before it was over, putting the production in a catastrophic state into the hands of his understudy, Kazuya Surumaki, I nonetheless believe that for what he did with it, Kare Kano was every bit as strong as Evangelion in its presentation, and is personally one of my favorite anime series of all time. To many anime fans though, it would seem as though Hideaki Anno went quiet after leaving the show, up until the announcement of the rebuild of Evangelion. Of course, the truth is nothing of the sort. Anno went right back to work on yet another live action film, with what I'd like to imagine was an okay fuck anime for real mindset after all those production issues, and released Shiki Jitsu in the year 2000. I have to confess, I haven't seen this film because I straight up can't find it. Even in this period though, Anno was no stranger to Gainax. He gave his voice to Naota's cat in Kazuya Tsurumaki's FLCL that same year, and did some storyboarding and cameos over the next two years for the studio's Mahoromatic and magical shopping arcade Abenobashi. In 2002, he directed the spastic anime commercial short Anime Tensho with Hiroyuki Imaishi, and it was around this time that Anno actually started working to try to get the rebuild of Evangelion Project moving. Yes, in 2002. Like most of what Anno involves himself with, the rebuild project didn't get off the ground at first, and wouldn't do so until years later. If you think about it, especially knowing how early on it was being planned, the idea behind the rebuild movies makes perfect sense. Even if Ava was one of the biggest and most influential anime of all time, it was still wrought with crazy production issues and was kind of an unwieldy, confusing mess a lot of the time. The impetus to recreate the thing, now that it was big and famous and could potentially pull as much money and talent as it needed to be all that it could be, is pretty obvious. I would even say that Anno's intentions of using Ava to propagate the evolution of animation was no less relevant at this point than it had been in 1995, but we'll get back to that momentarily. 2002 was also the year that Anno married Moyoko Anno, who, as I mentioned before, would later draw a manga about their relationship and how much of an otaku Anno is. It's worth mentioning that in 2004, when Moyoko's famous Magical Girl series Sugar Sugar Rune was being adapted to animation, her husband actually did some storyboard and key animation work for the series, even though it wasn't even remotely tied to anything he'd ever worked on before. Just wanted to point that out because it's kind of adorable, and it makes a hilarious what the hell moment if you look at this part of his career without knowing that his wife created the series. Anno popped his head up a few more times as a storyboard artist on Die Buster and as a supervisor on the Re-Cutie Honey OVA, while also writing and directing a fucking hilarious 12 minute live action film called Ryusei Kacho, which is available right here on YouTube and you should drop everything and watch it immediately after this video, it is awesome. Having seen Ryusei Kacho, Anime Tensho, Die Buster, and 
Abonobashi, Hideaki Anno's next live-action film, a Gainax-produced tokusatsu adaptation of Gonagai's classic Cutie Honey manga, which released alongside Gainax's own anime OVA series, makes perfect sense. Watching this film, I would just as easily have believed that Hiroyuki Imaishi or Kazuya Tsurumaki had directed it themselves. At this point, I'd have a difficult time even determining whether Imaishi and Tsurumaki developed their styles more out of working for Anno, or if they were seriously rubbing off on him. Whatever the case, Cutie Honey is a spastic, hilarious, carefree cartoon romp full of crazy visuals, adorable fan service, and awesomely bad special effects. While it may not have the depth of character that Anno's TV shows are known for, this film remains an excellent showcase of his talent for creating striking, memorable scenes that flow beautifully from image to image, and is a lot more cleaned up and coherent than his previous live-action work. I honestly kind of love this movie, and I think it fits into the overall Anno and Gainax catalog just as sensibly as anything else they've ever made. It even has Mayumi Shintani playing one of the villains, whom you may recognize as the voice of Haruko, Nonon, and Shibahime, given that she almost exclusively voice acts for Gainax series. I actually didn't even mention earlier that Megumi Hayashibara, who voiced Rei in Evangelion, made cameo voice appearances in Anno's previous films. But what I'm getting at here is that Anno's live-action work wasn't all that far removed from his anime work, especially in the case of his Cutie Honey film. After the release of Cutie Honey, it would seem that Anno really put his nose to the grindstone on trying to get the Rebuild series into development and establishing Studio Kara. For a while, his only appearances in the media were through random cameos in a handful of live-action films. It wasn't until 2006 that the Rebuild films were finally announced, with the first of the planned four-part series coming out in 2007. Now, once again, it would seem to a lot of people that from this point forward, Anno really didn't do much of anything besides work on the Rebuild films for like 10 goddamn years, and this isn't as incorrect as it was last time. More so than trying to follow Anno's career path from this point forward, what I'd like to try and pull apart is for what reason the Rebuilds have been presented in the way that they have been, and to what benefit. A lot of Hideaki Anno's famous quotations have accused the anime industry of stagnation. He has often accused animators and directors of looking inward too much and only being influenced by other anime, instead of pulling influences from outside mediums, which is something that he's consistently done throughout his career. He doom spoke the industry's inevitable collapse, though later clarified that he was too harsh and mostly meant that things would fall apart if they failed to evolve. Again, keep in mind this person's difficulty with communication. These kinds of statements from Anno are nothing new. He was decrying the past decade of anime as early as 2002. In his mission statement about the Rebuild films in 07, he stated among his desires that he wished to fight the trend of stagnation in the industry and to connect today's exhausted Japanese animation industry to the future. Where these statements become strange and a little confusing is when you stack them next to a series of films that are mostly just a remake of a 12-year-old TV show, which have themselves taken over eight years in production. It's hard to imagine that the Rebuild films have stayed in production for so long purely out of taking as long as they do to make, not when they're so profitable that there are entire Evangelion stores, theme parks, extensive brand deals, and more money being made through Ava-themed pachinko alone than through any other facet of the franchise put together. There is a series, a series of Ava Pachinko video games for the Nintendo DS. There is an Ava horse racing commercial. There is a market for Ava collectibles which is more comparable to a Sanrio character than to a typical anime series. And Studio Kara itself often has a hand in producing these things, such as creating fan servicey new animations for the pachinko machines. Evangelion is an industry in and of itself, and what better way to keep that industry running than to keep the hype alive for as long as possible? Instead of relapsing your hype train with bi-yearly reboots like Spider-Man does, you can keep an entire market afloat by blue-balling the patrons for the main attraction while billing them out of every sideshow on God's Green Earth. Now, of course, I don't mean to imply that I think they could have released these films as quickly as they wanted to had they chosen to do so, but I can't help but find some suspicion in the way that this project has continued unbroken by any of its directors or the studio behind it working on any other major pictures for over eight years now. But I don't necessarily mean to imply that Anno and his team are doing this out of greed. To make money? Sure. But let's return once more to Anno's mission statement, to revitalize the dying anime industry. If you're watching my channel, then it's highly likely that you've heard me talk about the dismal state of anime funding, especially for original programs along the lines of Evangelion. Less money means less work for talented people, and less room for newcomers to get started in the industry. Animation is constantly understaffed because the industry is staggeringly underpaid. In light of all this, if someone wanted to give work to as many talented and or young people in the
in the industry as they possibly could, then what better way to do so than by dumping as much money into it as you can get your hands on? Over the past three years, Hideaki Anno's intentions with the Rebuild films have seemingly become more clear. In 2012, Anno opened up a museum dedicated to tokusatsu miniatures, which he saw as a valuable medium which was sprouting death flags thanks to production costs and the increase of CG in special effects work. To commemorate the museum's opening, he co-created an eight-minute short film with longtime friend and fellow Gainax co-founder Shinji Higuchi, who'd spent most of his time since the 80s becoming a big-name special effects director in the world of tokusatsu. The short was produced by Ghibli and shot using miniatures and featured a god warrior from Nasuka of the Valley of the Wind descending on and destroying Tokyo. In 2016, Hideaki Anno and Shinji Higuchi will be teaming up again to direct the next live-action Godzilla film from Toho Studio, resurrecting the series after 10 years of dormancy. Towards the end of 2014, Studio Kara began releasing a bi-weekly series of short films entitled The Animator Expo, with Anno and Miyazaki attached as producers. Each episode of The Expo features a different staff with just about every noteworthy freelancer in the industry showing up across its run, alongside a swath of newcomers. If anything had ever seemed intended for the express purpose of injecting life into the industry of original animation, it's the Animator Expo. Now, as much fun as it's been having Anno pop up in random places, like as the voice of the main character in Miyazaki's The Wind Rises, it can be a little sad to see one of anime's greatest living directors get tied up with one series of movies for eight years especially one as controversial and argued over as the Rebuild films. It doesn't help either that he took Kazuya Tsurumaki along with him, whom I suspect is more or less the more prominent creative force behind the films since he's done even less outside of them in all this time. However, it stings a little less to see how they left Gainax in the capable hands of Hiroyuki Imaishi, who cranked out some of the studio's best work ever before branching off to form his own, even more outlandish studio in the form of Trigger. Even as a husk of what it once was with all of its big names gone, Gainax itself is still keeping afloat somehow, and they just put out an original series that a lot of people liked this year. If there ever was a time when Anno's career and personality seemed to be perfectly in alignment though, then that time would be right now. Hideaki Anno is otaku. Not just an otaku, but one of the otaku, to the point that he cares more about the state of the anime and tokusatsu industries than almost anyone else, and wants to see them blossom into further potential. After 20 years of being dicked around by producers and rarely getting things his way creatively, he became a producer himself, putting budgets into the hands of the industry's most bold and audacious creative talents and letting them do as they please. In Hideaki Anno's afterword of his wife's manga about their relationship, he goes on and on about how nicely her manga is able to communicate its feelings, and even goes so far as to say that it does a better job than his own Evangelion. You could easily write this off as Anno being cute for his wife or being overly humble, but at the same time, it totally seems like the kind of thing that he'd say in complete honesty. Anno has never liked himself much, he's never been that confident in his creations on a personal level, and he's always harbored a deep admiration for the work of others. If anyone was the right kind of guy to be funding other creatives and pushing their work over his own, it was this guy. Once again, everything I've said here is speculation, and should be taken with a dash of salt. I don't know Hideaki Anno any more than anyone else who's watched all of his films and read all of his interviews, and it's entirely possible that I've misinterpreted some of his intentions. Maybe the Rebuild movies really have just taken that long to make, and maybe his plans weren't so grandiose from the start. Maybe he's a little more confident than he lets on, or maybe his interviews are even more honest than I realize. Having been a fan of his work for as long as I have, and having read about him as much as I have though, I feel like this portrait of his character makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know if this is what Anno intended to communicate about himself, but it's what I interpreted about him, and I hope that in sharing this interpretation I've helped some of you to understand him a little better yourselves. Thanks again for watching. Hyogento アニメ